This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by SR3 Rescue Concepts because you don't know what you don't know. Life Saving Systems Corporation, we do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated hoist and winch provider. And Hilo Vodka, simply better vodka. SR3 Rescue Concept is a training company that can help you with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are ready to bring your agency up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is amazing! With certified and flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I'm happy to say that I get to be one of them, They offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has partnered with Petzl to assist with the PPE inspection course and the highly specific Lazard, which is used in helicopter cliff and mountain rescues. SR3 goes above and beyond the helicopter world too. They also provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com that's sr3rescueconcepts.com and follow them on instagram at sr3 underscore rescue that's sr3 underscore rescue we're also brought to you by life saving system corporation they manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear from my favorite harness as a rescueman the triton to the rescue baskets and litters, and of course, the most popular hoist hook in helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSC cuts, bends, welds, sews, and machines these products into existence every day and then sends them on their way to us. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com that's lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R that's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R We're also brought to you by Breeze Eastern Since the very first helicopter rescue in November 1945 Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions While much of the technology and unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those who get rescued has not. Contact Breeze Eastern today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. That's breeze-eastern.com. And we are brought to you by Hilo Vodka. Hilo Vodka is a premium craft vodka made from the highest quality ingredients and six times distilled. Hilo Vodka was made to be crisp, refreshing, and unintrusive. It's exactly how vodka should be made, clean enough to drink neat and worthy to be mixed with your favorite cocktails. They make a crisp, refreshing vodka that is carefully carbon filtered for a smooth sip and no bite. Hilo Vodka is 100% American made. It is proudly veteran owned by a former search and rescue pilot. Simply better vodka. Order yours today by visiting shophelovodka.com. That's shophelovodka.com. FedEx delivery is available in most states. Use the promo code capitals R-E-S-Q and you get 10% off your order. Plus if you buy three bottles or more, it's free shipping. Please remember to drink responsibly, and FAA Part 91 says eight hours, bottle the throttle. What's fun for me is when I start sitting around and talking to guys that, that I know from the Coast Guard and that I've, I've been around but actually never stationed with because we all have some similar stories, whether it's rescue, whether it's shot pranks, whether it's whatever it is, it's just funny to listen to the stories. So our next guest gives us a perspective from his entire time in the Coast Guard, and then what he's doing even after the Coast Guard, but still how he's tied in and connected with the Coast Guard. It is awesome to hear what this guy is doing. So please welcome my friend, United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer, number 191, Mr. Ron Tremaine. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer, number 500. 
These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Real Rescue Podcast. Today, I have with me a super good friend of mine. I'm super stoked to have him here. United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 191, Mr. Ron Tremaine. What's up, Ron? Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Dude, I am stoked to have you here. Thank you. It's good to see you too. How's things? Hey, they're really good. Before we go any further, I practice this, so I got to give it to you. (gasps) Um, I'm so excited already. (laughs) This goes all the way back to uh, our days in Pensacola. Okay. And with myself and Scotty Harrison and uh, Dwayne Lawson and Rod Parker. Through cold waves and seas we swim to the, to the flyer who's been down. We will never let you drown. 8920, we're your rescue swimmer heroes. Hoorah! Hoorah! Yeah! Ronnie, still got it. <laughs> yeah. I won't, I won't say how long ago that was. Yeah, this episode is done. Mic drop. We're, we're out. That, that was yeah, out. Was. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. <laughs> that was the summer of that was the summer of 1989. Dude, that's awesome. Uh, is it a bad thing? I don't remember ours right now. <laughs> 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 sorry, guys. That my class. I'm sorry. I forgot it. Dude, that's awesome. Well, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you coming in. Um, you and I got to go back. Uh, like we've crossed paths many, many times in many areas, including the civilian world. Like you and I were hanging out all, all of a sudden up in Barrow, Alaska for a week, which was awesome because you were playing with drones and stuff up there. And I was working with another company and we were doing our, our side, trying to uh, incorporate a whole bunch of different aspects to different rescues up there. It was, a, it was a good time. But for everybody else out there, if you don't mind, please give an introduction, uh, who you are, how you got into the Coast Guard, how you got to be a swimmer and, and then go from there. Hey, it sounds good. So uh, uh, Ron Tremaine grew up in uh, Salem, Oregon, and uh, uh, my family actually had friends who worked at um, Coast Guard Air Station Astoria when I was growing up. So that was kind of my first touch with the Coast Guard. And my grandparents had a fishing boat out of uh, Crescent City, California, which is on the Oregon-California border. And so I would spend my about half of my summer down there fishing with them. And every single time I saw that helicopter flying over, it was always in the back of my mind. Of, um, it'd be a good place to be in the future. And uh, then I went to college for a while, um, got a real education there. Um, not necessarily a, um, an academic education, but a, <laughs> but a good education. Uh, and, and then uh-huh. it came out that I, I should, maybe I should get a real job for a while. And so, you know, the Coast Guard came back around, I joined the Coast Guard. And my first unit was a small boat station in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Um, the swimmer program was just coming to be. Um, it was brand new. And I'm sure you've already talked about how the swimmer program came to be to begin with. And I have, yes. This was right in the beginning. So um, it seemed like a great program, something I wanted to do put my name on the list and uh, it took a, a solid two years to finally get to school. It was um, um, a long, long wait for a lot of us at that time. The school was backed up. And then at the same time, um, there was a guy who at the Navy rescue swimmer who, who was killed, a guy named Marecki. Yep. And, and when Marecki was killed, it really backed the school up. And he just happened. And I, I used to hear about Marecki all the time because I'm in Surgeon Bay, Wisconsin. And he was from Appleton, Wisconsin. Oh. And, and so it was all while I was in Wisconsin that, that it happened. And uh, so we'd hear it on the news every day, practically. And then one thing led to another. Had to wait a couple of years, finally get to school. And uh, yeah, the rest was history after that. I, after, after school, my first unit was um, uh, Coast Guard Air Station, Houston. Houston, Texas. Nice. But, so that's right. There's a little side note, a little uh, footnote in there for that one, because you were the first. I'll let you tell it. Oh, I was the first qualified swimmer in the great state of Texas. Well so done, sir. Is, thank you. <laughs> Yeehaw. So, yeah. Corpus had not gone online yet. They didn't go online for another, I don't know, I think like six or eight months after us. And so we were the first swimmers that were there. And there was, uh, from memory, um, already at the unit. 
um, was Roger Westerhoff, Willie Lorenzo, and a guy named Bob Yaw. And, and then John Lane and I were the first ones who had gone to sw swimmer school and had arrived. You know, everybody was ASMs back then. Yep. And um, they hadn't gone to swimmer school, although Roger and, Roger and Willie had gone to swimmer school, but they didn't have a swimmer program yet it implemented at, at Houston. So we showed, John Lane and I showed up and we were hard charging. So we got qualified first. Those guys, Roger and Willie were actually the first ones there. But we were the first ones that got qualified. Nice. So we kind of moved to the punch because we were anxious to go. And then Russ Lucier came in as our chief, as the first swimmer chief we had there. And uh, it was a great unit, good times, did a lot of fun things, a lot of big cases, learned a lot while I was there. Um, nice. Not, not big, big C's, but um, just a lot of crazy stuff. Really? Yeah. The, you know, Houston and Texas, like uh, – I was talking to Al Yates not too long ago, and and he had some pretty big stuff. Him and Olaf Lavelle out of Corpus, like yeah, I was like, holy cow! So I imagine that's where your first case was. Like, so my first case was actually um, my first case was so jacked up. So there was a guy <laughs> who had fallen off a shrimp boat, and the shrimp boat had reported their buddy had fallen off. So we fly out there and we're searching for him, and. Um, and the boat, and they just want to keep on shrimping. They didn't want to pull their nets to see if their buddy was in the nets or anything. They just want to keep on fishing. And we made them pull their nets, and we kept searching for this guy. And we're in a, de this, a desolate stretch of beach between uh, – literally halfway between Houston and Corpus Christi. And there's really nothing out there at all. And there was one guy um, who was driving the beach in his truck who had been um, surf fishing, and he starts waving frantically to us. So we thought he found the guy. So – uh, my very first deployment is they deployed me to the water. I swam in to talk to the guy and he said, Hey, I found this seat cushion. Is this what you're looking for? Oh my like, gosh. <laughs> and so they were like, Nope, <laughs> that wasn't it. At the same time, the same time as I get there and I, I radio back to the, um, to the helicopter, what had happened, they, uh, they get a chip light. And so they fly off. They go back to the airport to uh, check their chip light. Um, the guy in the truck, he's like, hey, have a nice day. He drives off. <laughs> and here I am in this desolate stretch of beach. I mean, there's nothing there. Just hanging out, waiting for the helicopter to come back. And as I'm hanging out, walking down the beach with nothing to do, here's Eddie the dead guy washed up. No way. And so <laughs> I was like, what the hell? And here I am in the middle of nowhere by myself, and this guy washes up. And so... The boat, the, the fishing boat was, you know, four or five miles offshore. I couldn't signal him and the helicopter had already landed. And we had the old PRC 90 radios back then, which had like a mile range on them. <laughs> yeah, and uh, nothing. Could, you're just talking into the middle of nowhere. You just, yeah. Can anybody hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> so you had the good swimmer that I was. I start CPR on this dude out there. Oh, all by my buddy. Nice job. <laughs> and so I start CPR on him and uh, uh, I've been doing CPR for like a half an hour, 45 minutes and the Coast Guard boat um, comes by. So I light off a flare to signal them and uh, uh, because they didn't have the same freaks uh, on their radios that we had on the PRC 90, which no, go, of go figure that. That's yeah, right. <laughs> and they, they did so, square that away much later. So yeah. that's all squared. <laughs> now we can talk to boats and helicopters. It's great. It only <laughs> took what five or 10 years to fix yeah, that problem. You know, learn. Um, so then we, uh, so they, they make their way into shore. I uh, carry this dude out, have to swim him out of ways because they couldn't get in without grounding. And we get the guy in the boat. I continue on doing CPR as they're motoring back to the state, um, back to the boat ramp where they were at. And about that time, here comes the helicopter. And I'm doing compressions on this dude. And we're zinging along. And we're like a mile away from the dock at where the ambulance was. Um, the helicopter comes down, does a low flyby. And I look up and uh, the pilot's laughing at me. And, and a flight mech named Tony Johnson was in the, wind, in the door. And he gives me the finger. And then they just keep on going. <laughs> It left me as I'm doing CPR. We dropped the guy off of the ambulance. And that was my first case. Oh my gosh. Wow. What, what an in, intense, crazy memory. Yeah. It was, oh. I look back on that now and I, I still will never forget the fact that here I'm just walking along a desolate beach. 
and the dead dude washes up. Like, what's the chances of that? Yeah. Holy cow. What the? You're like, uh, <laughs> help. So I ended up doing CPR to do for like, like an hour and a half or two hours. That Need, is a long to, time. Needless Holy to say, he didn't make it. But hey, I did my job. You did your job. Well done, sir. I, I was a diligent little swimmer. <laughs> oh, man. Just like totally high speed and motivated, too. You get down there. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That was, that's all it was. And they were <laughs> like, you really think you should still be doing CPR? I'm like, hey, that's what the book says. Yeah, right, do. right. Yeah. That's <laughs> what the book says. I, guess yeah. <laughs> I have not had uh, somebody hire me say, stop. Keep right, going. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Nice, dude. Nice. Well, you, uh, you've you had a couple other big cases in your career, and um, I found one of them online, which is pretty cool, and you've earned yourself a DFC. So, well done, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, that is one of the ones I want to talk about today. And then I, I, if you want to talk about any other ones, I'm all in. But I do want to read this one because this is pretty cool. And this is as you with you as a chief, too. So, for everybody that doesn't understand the um, military structure or the Coast Guard structure, a chief is an E7 in the military or in our in our branch. And, you know, so you're in charge of the shop. So you might stand duty once or twice a week or maybe once a week because you want to give the younger guys the opportunity to get in there and, and go. So here you are as the chief of the shop. Boom, you get launched out on kind of a big case. So... It's yeah, exciting. so so it was actually it was a, a number of cases. It was um, I didn't know if you had the write up there or not. I um, do. As a matter of fact, let me read the write up, and then you can kind of dive into all, right, all this. This is this is going to be fun. All right, citation to accompany the award of the Distinguished Flying Cross to Ronnie L. Tremaine, Chief Aviation Survival Technician, United States Coast Guard. Chief Petty Austin Tremaine is cited for heroism while participating in serial flight as rescue swimmer of Coast Guard H-60 Jayhawk helicopter 6022 on 4 December 2007. With the Pacific Northwest and theras of a tremendous storm marked by torrential downpours and hurricane force winds, Coast Guard rescue helicopter was launched from Coast Guard Air Station Astoria, Oregon, just prior to midnight in response to hundreds of civilians in the perilous vicinity of Chehalis, Washington. At great personal risk, Chief Tremaine was lowered nine times into rolling flood waters filled with hidden hazards, including live power lines, logs, and debris, placing himself in extraordinary peril by entering the flooded waters to an unstable house in darkness Chief Tremaine demonstrated exceptional skills and physical stamina by shepherding victims together and then setting up the hoist needed to transport them to safety. Chief Tremaine waded through swift, chest-deep water contaminated with debris, concealed obstacles to enter the homes of an elderly, diabetic man. Demonstrating superior technical expertise, Chief Tremaine guided the rescue basket beneath the carport and into the sheltered waters when the man could be evacuated safely. Chief Tremaine led by precision rescue of a pregnant woman and her family by preparing a platform just big enough for the rescue basket to be loaded in the midst of a live down power lines and broken tree limbs. Chief Tremaine's actions, skills, and heroism were instrumental in the rescue of 21 people. His courage, judgment, and devotion to duty in the face of hazardous conditions are most heartily commended in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. Damn, Ron. That's pretty bad. That's awesome. Actually, you know, it's funny because I think they got the numbers wrong on there because we that night we actually picked up 21 in one in one shot. And then ultimately we picked up, I think, 40 or 44 people total that night. Holy smoke. So the numbers are a little off on that. But uh, what was funny was, you know, I, I will say first and foremost that, you know, my crew was top notch. Awesome. Um, you know, I had a, a good friend of mine, Rob Potter. He was the AC. And then uh, our 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 co-pilot was uh, Gronky. And Gronk, let me just tell you, this guy 
we couldn't have had a better co-pilot because he'd been a 60 he was brand new to the coast guard but he had like two or three thousand hours under his belt flying 60s in the army oh and so, nice so he had more experience actually than the, in, the, in the 60 than the ac had and but he hadn't been in the coast guard long enough so he was still technically a co-pilot but yeah I mean, the guy had the skills and was there and then an absolutely great flight mech too. And, uh, um, when we launched, there was a storm that had hit the, uh, the Pacific Northwest and it was a cat five hurricane anywhere else. Matter of fact, the, uh, the bar tower in Tillamook, Oregon, um, it registered the winds at 151 knots before, before the, uh, the wind meter actually broke in the bar tower. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah, so it was it was a consistent 120 knots in, with higher gusts that night, and we had, um, it, and it lasted a, a solid 24 hours. Um, what knocked out the storefronts, you know, in Astoria, um, you know, the air station performed flawlessly because uh, the power had been knocked out for like three to five days. Yet we had plenty of flights to do with no power. Everything was knocked out through the city and we were able to you know the entire air station was able to get it done we actually had to bring a fema trailer to set up um had to fly it in um to have comms at the air station actually wow. Wow. and um let me just say about the award you know i i, I honestly like, like you uh, could care less about the awards and whatever <laughs> medals we get um but but the thing that makes me most proud about that medal is it was awarded to me by one of my closest friends uh uh, Vice Admiral Courier, who at the time was a D-13 Admiral, and uh, later on, he really became, he and Mary Jane became pseudo-grandparents to my kids. Aw, that's awesome. And, and he ascended to become the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, and then post-Coast Guard, we we worked together, actually. I actually hired him as my uh, my senior advisor, and we worked um, on some pretty big projects together, so it was great that he was the one who, you know, who pinned the medal on me. Oh, that that's super cool. That that is super cool. You know, I, I'll tell you, Ron, a, a couple things. So one, awesome job. I, I agree with you. You can't do it without an amazing crew above us. Um, you know, as a hoist operator now, I I mean, I my my sole job is to make sure that my swimmer or my rescue man is good to go, and my there, you know, whatever I can do to help them on the ground from the air. You know that there is there's not enough said about what the crew does in the aircraft. You know, I mean, we get a lot of the glory being on the hook and being down on the ground, but shout out to everybody out there. And I truly mean this. You guys are working just as hard as we are on the ground up in the air. You really are. No, I completely agree. And and that particular night was actually, it, it was a great example of how the entire crew comes together and works as a team. Yeah. And, it, you know, I said the numbers are off on the, uh, the award that we, you know, picked up at 40 or 44 people that night. Um, the reason I remember that is because the first rescue we did that night was we flew to the airport in Chehalis, Washington, and there were 23 people at the airport. And um, when we get there, the helicopter, the H-65 out of Port Angeles was already on site picking up people at the airport. And I, I love to tell the story because um, I didn't know the person at the time, but now he's one of my closest friends. Um uh, but, uh, the 65, um, had a pilot on board, um, Dan Longbetter, who, uh, um, he calls us and he's like, hey, okay, we got 23 people here. We've got two. How many can you pick up? We're going to go drop these two off and we'll be back. And I was on the radios and I was like, yeah, we got them. And he's like, no, how, how many are you going to pick up? Because we got two, we're going to come back and get, get more. So how many? And I was like, yeah, we got them. Like, no, there's 21 people there. Like, yeah, I know. We got them. <laughs> and so we picked up 21 people. We got all 21 into the helicopter. And uh, um, as we like to call figured, that, there's packed in there, nut to butt. <laughs> oh, everybody was packed in so tight. But the best part was he finally figured out what I was telling him. And he was like, and for those of you that don't know her listening in, uh, the H60 is quite a bit bigger than the H65. And so uh, we're kind of the big brother there. And so we said we could pick them up all up. He was just like, Roger out. And they left. And, uh, um, you know, on the radio, had... he's like, Roger out. And, he's exactly. all and then you get on ICS and like, freaking 60. They're not even so, sharing the work. 
So we didn't figure it out until years later when we were working at, we were at headquarters after I was retired from the Coast Guard and we were talking about this and he's like, yeah, I did a big rescue in, uh, in Chehalis, Washington one night. And I was like, how many pit pills did you pick up at the airport? And he's like, two. And then that damn 60 came in behind. And I was like, ah, that was you. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. When you can like recap a story and then it like comes together. Oh, that's yeah, fantastic. yeah that, it all came together. They, he was the guy in the front helicopter and we came up behind and, and picked up all 21 to their, their measly two. Oh, and so cool. uh, um, it, it was pretty good. Uh, we still talk about that on occasion. And what's even better is he is transferring this summer up to be the uh, um, uh, chief of operations in, in Seattle for District 13. Wow. So, He'll be the guy calling the shots for uh, um, for the air stations in the Northwest now, which is kind of funny. Gosh, that's funny. So 21 yeah, so, people right off the get-go, right? Yeah, right? actually. So the very last one, so we picked up 21, and the very last person um, tried to climb out of the basket as, they were, as we were picking them up. And uh, the plane surged a bit, big winds. And I got smacked in the mouth and chipped my tooth that oh. night. And, and oh, so, man. We get the we get all them out of there. I get in the door and I was literally hanging onto the handles with my knees on the uh, on the uh, on the deck, and so my feet are actually hanging outside the plane, so we could get to where we could actually drop these people off. And wow. so we we took them all to some high school, landed in the middle of the football field, offloaded them, and then went back out for our next rescue. Wow. And uh, what was really crazy about that night is it really I mean it wasn't big seas in, in like some of the other cases that we all all had but it was very technical because middle of the night there's no power big storm and you know trying to get between power lines and stuff that part was really true that it was it was hard for everybody to keep our eyes out and we're you know hover taxiing around neighborhoods trying to in big trees old neighborhoods with big trees and power lines trying to figure out where people are and how to get to people it made it you know very technical i think but uh the thing I remember most about that night, those cases, uh, it, it talked about the uh, the diabetic man. Yeah. We so the house was right along the river that had flooded out. So his house was, you know, it was probably it, the house actually ended up being washed away when it was all done. It said, but we got there just in time. Um, had to swim into the house and find the guy. He was in his bed bedroom on his bed. The bed was actually floating, and it was about <laughs> oh. Um, there was about a foot below the door jam, the top of the door jam. So there was a lot of water in there, but what? I get this guy and he's an elderly gentleman. And I could tell this house was, you know, it's, he probably built the place for all I know and all his, you know, hopes and dreams are there. And I could see all these old family pictures. And I asked the guy, I was like, Hey, I might be able to grab a couple, I can get you and maybe grab a couple items. There's something you really want me to grab. And he's like, yep, grab that bottle of vodka. <laughs> and I was like, no, do you want me to grab pictures or anything? He's like, just grab that bottle of vodka. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I grabbed him and the vodka, swam him out, and we ended up picking him up out of there. And oh. uh, <laughs> all your hopes and dreams, and all they wanted was that bottle of vodka. <laughs> and, and, and then we go to another house where we picked up, I think it was, if memory serves me right, it was where the pregnant lady was and her family. And that was actually, they were flooded out. I had to swim into the second story of the house. And um, we, there was actually, it wasn't the pregnant lady that we were worried about. They had the lady in there who was in her eighties and same scenario. I get the pregnant person out and get the rest of the people on. I've got the, the elderly lady. And I asked them, I say, you know, is it, do you want me to grab anything? Just grab that carton of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> vodka and cigarettes this doesn't get any better and <laughs> and so i made sure she had a carton of cigarettes and swam her out and we take them up to the same football field and drop them off and you know what's i forgot what's the rotor wash under a 60 like 120 miles an hour oh it's yeah it's and ridiculously so, strong yeah it's and gnarly. so we land we land to offload and before she just as she gets outside the rotor wash and before she can get to the uh the running track that goes around the football field Yep. She was already lighting up a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> oh my good lord! So probably, probably one of those nerves are kicking. I'm, we're gonna cut and put it to nerves. She was nervous about the flight, so she. Oh, 
I got, I got to light up. Oh, that was a scary flight, scary day. <laughs> yeah, it's just I've never forgotten the fact that out of all the life memories you could grab, and one wanted vodka and the other wanted cigarettes. <laughs> oh man, you know what? I got to think about that. I'm not sure what I would grab other than my wife. I would take my wife with me, honey. Yeah. Well, I mean. Her. I'm looking at old pictures on the wall and you, yeah. you know that stuff's all going to get washed away. I can probably grab a couple like, nope, all I want is cigarettes and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. Oh man, that's funny. That's funny. It's all about priorities, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact you were swimming into the second floor of a house. Yeah. Like, that's that how high pretty... the water is. Like... Yeah. It, it was, it was, uh, it was honestly, you know, this was post Katrina yep. and it was like Katrina with everything you saw in Katrina, only with big winds and middle of the night. Wow. Yeah, and we all talked about how, like, if if, uh, if it had been daylight, this would have been big news, but it was in the Pacific Northwest that doesn't get a lot of news coverage, and it was the middle of the night, so nobody saw this. But, I mean, it, yeah. it completely washed out the entire town of, of Chehalis. It closed I-5 for, like, a week, which um, for any of those, anybody who knows um, the Northwest, I-5 is the major – freeway that runs all the way from Washington to it is the primary freeway from Washington through down to Mexico. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Dang, man. Yeah. That so it was, a, it was a pretty intense night and it wasn't just our crew. There was another crew that all got DFCs that night as well. And that was uh, Mike Spencer and his crew. And they did, they did just as many crazy things. I think they actually rescued a dog too. Oh, we didn't, nice. We didn't need dogs, but they got the sympathy vote, I think. Yeah. <laughs> definitely from my wife she you got sympathy vote from her for sure yeah <laughs> man that's awesome well i i tell you i don't want to stop there because you have had an incredible career uh so i know you have a couple that like kind of stand out to you so if you're willing to share a couple of the other ones you you know um you know i think the first big case that i had um was in houston and uh, uh um, you know, I've always been a little torn on this one because it was two divers who went off a dive boat. They had uh, um, been reported as not surfacing. So they called the Coast Guard to fly out there and look for these guys. We flew out there um, in the evening and we searched until, I don't know, 10 or 12 o'clock at night. And uh, um, just at sunset, I thought I saw somebody. And so we circled back around, came into a hover. And about that time, uh, a dolphin surfaced. And so we saw the dolphin surface like, oh, it's a dolphin. And then we continued on our search. Well, we get up in the morning, we do a first light search. And uh, I think we did, if I remember, we did two flights. And our second flight, it was uh, at the end of our flight. And we're like, this is it. If we don't find these guys. It's the end of the search. We're not going to search any longer for them. And um, the pilot had just called bingo. And when he called bingo, uh, I, sp I spotted both guys in the water, treading water. Treading water, still and, alive. Yeah. So they'd been treading water for a solid 18-ish hours. Holy cow. And and the problem had been is they they dove off the dive boat, but they got caught in the cross current. And when they surfaced, they surfaced like half a mile from the boat, and they couldn't make the swim back to the boat, and they kept drifting further and further away. No way. Yeah. So okay. um, the bad thing about it is when we picked them up, we picked up um, – one guy who was unconscious and the other guy was conscious and the unconscious guy ultimately died. And the bad thing is when we saw them, um, you know, we thought when I thought I saw something the night before um, it was them, <gasps> we saw the dolphin and they said that we came into a hover right next to him. And that I pointed to where they said, the guy in the orange suit pointed right at me. And then we flew away. He's like, we thought you went to get a boat. Oh, and no way. And so we had actually seen them and uh but we just didn't see them when we were in a hover we saw the dolphin instead and uh and unfortunately the person who passed away um died of hypothermia because he one guy had a, uh, a wetsuit on the other guy didn't have a wetsuit and had we picked him up that had we spotted them when we thought we saw him the day the night before they would have both lived oh but, uh, that's tough man so the the tough thing about that case was um when i deployed into the water I didn't realize that we had some friends there with us too. We, uh, we had three hammerheads circling around below us and, and there were um, barracuda that were 
were uh, attacked. There was two Barracuda that kept attacking at them. And they were, the Barracuda were going after the buckles on their fins and the silver, the valve on their, uh, um, on their tank and yeah. their wash. There was just, they were hitting anything shiny. And so I saw the, uh, the sharks. The first thing I saw when I went under to do my uh, disentanglement to make sure they were clear, I saw the sharks and I was like, holy shit. And the first thing that came back, the funny thing is, you know, everything goes back to training. Yeah. And I will never forget being in the pool one day and Butch Flythe was, was one of our instructors. One of mine too. Had... One of mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Butch. So if, you had, if you haven't had Butch on yet, you got to have him on here. Um, Working on it. Good. So I will never forget somebody in my class. I don't remember who it was. We we're swimming laps and they're yelling at us and calling us mean names and not treating us very nice while we're in the pool. <laughs> and, and somebody said, it said, Petty Officer Flythe, what do you, what do you do if you see a shark? And, and he's like, sharks, there are no such thing. And we just got swimming. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that when I saw those sharks, the first thing I thought was bush fly yelling at us. There are no such thing. So I just <laughs> pretended they weren't even there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, oh, no kidding. And Dude, that's so, awesome. <laughs> so then um, – the entire time I'm trying to, uh, you know, get their regulators off them and stuff and get them so I can get them packaged up so I can get them out of there. The Barracudas kept attacking. So I'd try to kick those bastards away or swat them away and they move just out of arm's length. And as soon as I'd go back to doing work, they'd come right back in and attack again. And uh, they, were, they were ferocious and um, put the unconscious guy in the basket, hoisted him out. And now I'm worried because we got the sharks and they've already hit the surface of the water now. And the, the helicopter has seen the sharks and they were a little panicked. And, and my only thought was, holy shit, we just called bingo just before they deployed me. There's a good chance they could leave me here with, while they fly <sighs> off and get gas and come back, you know, with oh, my friends, wow. with my new friends that I got here. And so uh, um, I put the guy in the in the strop i clipped in and we rode up together and i mean as soon as we broke the water we were so low on gas that we went into forward flight and we ended up landing on the beach no you didn't even make it back to the airport no no we had to have a fuel truck come out come out and refuel us but yeah that was uh that was my um probably one of the biggest cases i had when i was in houston wow it was pretty crazy it was a good time Rod, that's freaking Dude, literally, like you hear stories about this, and we always talk about it amongst each other. You know, when you have, you know, sharks yeah. and stuff circling. You literally had sharks swimming around. You. Yeah, they were they were hammerheads too. That was my first encounter with hammerheads. They were, uh, um, it was pretty intense. But like I said, I can't believe of all people to come back to me. There's butch flies screaming at me. There's no such <laughs> thing as sharks. I'll never forget that. You know, Butch has been in the back of my mind my entire career. <laughs> Butch, I love you, buddy. Come on. Well, I, I appreciate everything you did to us in school. <laughs> you got to be honest. I mean, there, there's worse people to have in the back of your mind, you know? Absolutely. He, he's top notch. From, he's done so much for the rate and so much for the swimmer program oh. from day one. So we all, we all owe him a, a lot of credit. Dang, man. That's awesome. <laughs> it's just now when I wake up in the middle of the night and he comes to me in my thoughts, it's not such a good thing anymore. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. Gosh. Wow. Yeah. What so a, what a good honestly, case. you know, for the entire, I, I would say that, you know, as far as SAR goes, I was pretty fortunate. I had a lot of big cases and, um, you know, I always loved it. I always just, it was just a good time. I didn't, you know, I always love flying. I always love doing the swimmer thing. And um, it is by far some of my best memories, bar none. Um, but when I look back at it all, I, you know, it was all about the camaraderie too. Yeah. And all the uh, um, uh, practical jokes and games and everything. I mean, it was such good times. <laughs> brick, playing brick ball and Kodiak with one another. Oh, and, and brick then, ball. So let me give everybody an idea about this one. So you want to have a fun little game. Some people probably already know this, but others are like, what the heck is brick ball? So the, the object of the game is to get a the little five or 10 pound brick that you use in the bottom of the pool, right? So it sinks and you got it. And when you're holding it, you're basically holding it like a football, 
uh, or a, yeah, I guess it's football for rugby too, the rugby ball, and you're holding it tight and you're swimming in a way. You're not allowed to break the surface as long as you're holding it, but then your, your goal is to put it on the other guys on the other side of the pool. And then in the goal. Yes. Yeah. So you split into, you split into two teams. Yep. You split into two teams and one team's um, their, their mission is to get it into your goal yep. and your mission is to get it into their goal. And there's really two rules to brick ball. You can't throw the brick right. and you can't surface with the brick. Right. Otherwise, anything goes. Anything goes. And that and is it, anything goes. is. <laughs> and I would say that it's a rare occasion that the game doesn't end up with, with at least two guys ending up in a fight. Yeah. And bleeding. Somebody's bleeding. Oh, by the Somebody's end of one Somebody's bleeding. <laughs> I've seen nose, noses explode underwater. People getting kicked, punched, you name it. I mean, yeah. it's... That was a good time. There's always the the tap it out, you know, like you you gotta tap out. I remember uh, uh Tim what McGee. Was that? Well tap, tap it out is played by that rule. Well, wait, we had to after somebody decided to pass out underwater and you have to bring it to the surface. It was like, oh, you got a tap out rule. So Tim McGee's got the brick, and one guy goes down, he's holding him, trying to wrestle it out. He lets go, he goes to the surface. Well, the other guy came in and get Tim again. So Tim's like, oh he had like two or three Man, guys I'm trying to hit him. I will tell you what, the best brick ball player I've ever seen is uh, a guy we used to call the lung, and it was a guy named Mike Doss. And Mike Doss, you know, he uh, he didn't do a full career. He I think he did Cape Cod and then went to Kodiak. We were stationed together in Kodiak, and he got out after Kodiak. But I will tell you, this dude is a machine, and nobody can hold it their breath longer than Mike Doss. And so he would, I mean, he would take everybody beating the hell out of him, and he was just still outlast everybody. And by the time everybody's <laughs> tired and he's still underwater, then he'd finally surface and score. But he, he was just like a lung with arms and legs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, that's great. Man, uh, what a good, good time. Times. Yeah, the shop camaraderie is, is just unreal in the, in the swimmer shopping world. It's just like I've, yeah. I've never yeah. been anywhere else that has that same – that's that same uh, just group in the practical jokes oh I mean, so funny this so funny I, I will never forget um you know some of the best practical jokes i saw and this are bad but uh i was in kodiak with kevin peterson and jim metza and jim metza and kevin peterson when they were non-race they were in i think Sault Ste. Marie stationed together. They lived together before they became swimmers. And then we all ended up in Kodiak together. And at one point, Kevin had gone, he'd married somebody from Sault Ste. Marie. He flies back to see her family for vacation and he comes back and uh, um, we're all out um, one day fishing. And he was like, Hey Jim, I really need to talk to you. And he was like, what, remember that girl that you dated for a while? And then she just disappeared. He's like, yeah. He's like, I saw her. I saw her at the grocery store and we're home. And he's like, you did? He's like, Jimmy, she's got a kid now. And it's your kid. <laughs> and he was in a panic because now Jim's married and he's got two little girls. And <laughs> this, this went on for like two weeks. Jim's trying to figure out how he's going to tell his wife, <laughs> and explain to her. And, and Kevin's like, hey, man. She doesn't want any child support. She just wanted to let you know that she's doing well and his son's doing well. And, that, and uh, oh my God, that's terrible. That's hilarious. Oh, he, and terrible. He's trying to figure out how to call the, uh, you know, how to get an attorney because he wants to do the right thing and pay the child support. Does he start to, you know, form a relationship with this kid? I mean, it went on for like two or three weeks until Jim and I are in, are in uh, Cordova together on deployment and he was like on the verge of a nervous breakdown and I completely forgot all about this. And I thought it was like dead and under the water. And until, uh, one of the, I, I said something smart ass to Jim when he was walking through the galley and Harl Romine, one of his pilots was like, Hey, you can't give Jim a hard time. He's going through some really tough things right now. And I was like, tough things. What's he talking about? I would know before you would know. And, <laughs> and I, then it hit me. I was like, Oh, does this have to do with an illegitimate kid? He's like, Oh, Jimmy told you about this. <laughs> and I was like, ah! So then I had to pull him in. I was like, Hey, Jim, you know your kid? 
the, the, the illegitimate kid you got that you fathered that's running around Michigan to get now? And he's like, yeah, I don't know what to do, Ron. And I was like, it's bullshit. Kevin made it all up. <laughs> <laughs> that, I think that was the most extreme. That, that is thing. like, that's up there. Get, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that one might actually be <laughs> over the line. I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's pretty good. You know, you always hear the other ones. I, I've seen guys where you come in, you flip their entire uh, foot locker or their entire locker upside down. So they come back yeah. from vacation and everything's just trashed. And <laughs> we that, put, um, that's good. When I was in Houston, we put Russ, Russ Lucier, who was the shop chief at the time. Um, he was our first swimmer chief in Houston. We put his locker in the, uh, in the CEO's office <laughs> and uh, he came to work and he couldn't find his locker. And then he figured out it was in the CEO's office. So he just walked into the CEO. The CEO's in there in a meeting, having a meeting in his office. Russ walked in, opened up his locker, changed clothes, got dressed, shut the locker door, and walked out just like it was locker. <laughs> Captain? Yep. <laughs> oh, that's was, pretty good. It was good stuff. Man, it's, you know, the practical jokes got fun. One of my buddies is like, hey, you can only take it so far. So you got to you gotta bring it down. Because once it starts, it's always trying to be one up. <laughs> oh, and it never stops. And it'll follow you for years. Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. All right. So I, I do have, I have a question as far as you going into Kodiak. So Kodiak was a big unit for me. I had some really good cases up there. I can only imagine you had one or two out of Kodiak that, that stand out to you? You know, I, I had some really good cases in Kodiak. I had a lot of good cases in Kodiak actually. And, um, you know, I, I got a couple air medals while I was there for cases, but honestly, the cases that were the biggest cases that I've ever had, we didn't get any medals for. And happens. It, it, and I think that's the way it should be. And I will never forget. Um, I was, we did a case up in, uh, up in the Bering Sea where we picked up, up uh, a load of um, a fishing boat sank. And I think we picked up four or five people, but it was rough as hell. I mean, it was 60, 70 knot winds, 20, 30 foot seas. It was big, big stuff. And um, there's another case where the plane broke and they flew off and they left me treading water there. And so I was treading water for a couple hours in the bearing. While they flew off, they flew, I think they went to King Salmon, if I remember right, dropped them off at King Salmon, fixed the plane real quick, and they came back out to pick me up. And um, they get there, they pick me up, and I'll never forget, um, we had a, a new a new pilot, Tom Murphy, who was fresh from the Navy, who was with us, and uh, the AC was a good friend of mine, uh, Mike Kendall. And we get, they pick me up, and you know, you know, things have settled down. We're flying home now. And, you know, this is a big case. Yeah. And well, and and, let's back up a little bit because you haven't really touched on too much of the actual case other than the fact you got left in the water for an extended oh, well, amount of time. So yeah. what do you, what did you get called out on? So we got called out on the sinking vessel. Okay. So it, it was a sinking vessel. We flew out and the vessel had sunk. They were in the raft when we got there. And so it was just a matter of, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. Although it was big seas and winds, um, it was just taking each guy out of the uh, um, out of the raft, popping the raft, and then unfortunately, when they're in there, I was the last hoist, and when, so when they're getting ready to hoist me, they and they had problems and I had to fly off and leave me. And, and the just, worst part about it is you just popped the raft to get back in the aircraft. Well, oh man, that, that could be the worst part. I, I would say the even worse part was they flew off and left me and forgot to drop drop the rafts you drop the lr1 to me oh so, no so, so it's like a double whammy you're like i just popped the one that these guys were living <laughs> in and you forgot to leave me once right and it sank pretty a... quick it sank pretty quick so there was no chance of being able to patch it or anything it was a uh, it was gone so it was just uh yeah just me hanging out and singing songs having a good time <laughs> oh my gosh ron what the heck but yeah, the part about that case that I'll never forget, and it's always resonated with me, is uh, as we're flying back and things have settled down, and um, uh, the co-pilot had asked, us, "Wow, you know, this was huge. It's one of the biggest cases I've ever known. You know, since I've come into the Coast Guard. What type of medal should we put in for?" <laughs> and and I'll never forget Mike Kendall. Mike Kendall's like medals for what? Doing our job, <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. Done. And I agree with him. He's like, you know, our, our, 
or your medal was we just picked up four people. We had the benefit to have the opportunity to pick up four people today. Yeah. You just see four guys live. There's, there's your medal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was a, a really good case. We also had a case um, on the very last halibut opener before they went to quotas. You know, halibut openers used to be huge. And um, for everybody's understanding, the way a halibut opener used to work was um, the Department of Fishing Game for Alaska would say, we're going to have a 24-hour fishing derby for halibut sometime this week. But they would never say exactly when. And it was all based on um, tests that they would, you know, check the halibut and try to figure out when the best time to catch them were. And yeah. so what would happen is, in this 24-hour period, it doesn't matter what the weather's like. I mean, it, it could be hurricane force winds. You get this 24 hours to fish. Right. And so you've got to go out there and work no matter what the weather's like. You know, you could get lucky and have clear blue days, or it could be just snot. Yeah. And, um, and so what would happen is you get all these guys that would go out and they'd fish super hard for 24 hours, and they'd load their boats up with fish, and then inevitably a storm would hit on the second 24 hours now that it's closed and everybody's loaded down. So your, right. your boats are loaded, they're heavy. And, and, um, you know, that's when the weather picks in and next thing you know, you're in trouble. And so, um, we all used to look all of us in the shop used to look forward to halibut openers. Cause there was, I forget, there was two or three or four of them every year. And it was always, it meant big SAR cases. And so, you would all jockey. Everybody's jockeying like, okay, do I, do I do it before the 24 hours when everybody's going out or do I do it during the 20 stand duty during the 24 hours or after the 24 hours? <laughs> it's like a lottery. You never know what's going to hit. Right. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's and, putting your name in the hat. Yeah. Which, you know, like there's a lot of people that have, you know, we talk about this about ourselves. There's something wrong with us with stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. Uh, when, when, like the biggest, I want the biggest waves, the hardest winds, yeah, put me in, coach. <laughs> and if we want to, you know, it's almost looking, you're looking for misfortune on somebody else. So it, we can it get totally is. <laughs> it totally is. It's there. Because you I don't, don't know want anything bad to happen not. to somebody. But if nah, something bad is going to happen, so you want to make it. Happen. Let's, let's make yeah. it worth our while. Let's go. Let's make this let's go time. <laughs> yeah. And so it was the very last ha halibut opener. And, uh, it, we had we ended up having two cases that day and they they changed so what happened was after this after this opener they changed the whole policy to where it went to quotas where it just meant that every boat could catch x amount of pounds and they would what they would do is they take a look at your past three years how much halibut you've caught over the past three years and give you an average of what you could catch but then it it made it more safer because if you had if you could catch ten thousand pounds of halibut, well now you've got six months to go out and catch your ten thousand pounds. You don't have to catch it in twenty four hour period. Yeah. So it made it much more safer. But you know, it made the whole rodeo of the halibut opener and the I mean the whole town was just alive. It went crazy. Like the the radio station would play um, halibut opener music twenty four hours straight, and it was just <laughs> crazy. And um, but on the last opener, we flew out. And I, and it was so sad because. We ended up picking up a family, and it was pretty nice weather, but they had a brand new boat, or brand new to them. It was the first time they'd ever fished it, and it was like an 80 or 90 foot boat, and the whole family's working this thing, and the boat sinks. And we picked up the family. They wanted me to help save the boat, and I was like, look, it's time to go, because the boat, it was half underwater, oh. and there was just no saving it. And it was just sad to see a family that had put their entire life savings into this boat. They were looking for this halibut opener to probably make their first payments. Yeah. And the next thing you know, the boat sinks on them, but we got everybody out of there safe. And, you know, so it was really, it was great that we could save everybody, but it was yeah. really sad that, uh, um, you know, everything they, they put their whole life into just sunk in a matter of days of owning something. Yeah. Um, that's hard. But then later that night we picked up, um, a Russian boat that had sank and it, this is when things got ugly and it was, you know, 70, 80 knot winds late at night, middle of the night. And uh, a boat was able to pick up everybody but one, one person. And they were out of Homer and uh, we flew out there and it was uh, in Shelikov Straits, which is the area between um, Kodiak Island and the Alaska Peninsula. So yep. it's basically, it's a, it's a hundred mile long wind tunnel. 
and with big mountains on both sides. Yeah, so it yep. makes really confused winds, confused seas. And we picked up this, um, so this boat out of Homer sank and we flew out and another fishing boat was able to pick up three or four of the people off the boat, but there was one person they couldn't pick up. And um, so we were able to actually save him and, and that was a good thing. But I mean, I'll tell you, that was a, that was a rough night because I will never forget um, while I was in the water and they're trying to get in the position to hoist. Um, you know, I watched waves come up and just missed the, uh, um, um, the tail wheel. Wow. It came very close to hitting the tail wheel. And I was so like, you're talking like probably 40, 40 foot. It was big. Yeah, it was big. And it was, you know, you had a pretty consistent, you know, set of waves coming, but then you just got one freak wave that, that came up high. And I remember thinking to myself, Oh, this is going to get ugly if I got to take care of this guy and try to figure out how to help the guys in the helicopter if the helicopter goes down. And yeah, I was, I was actually thinking about what are we going to do if the if the helicopter ends up going to, going down. Once I saw a couple waves come really close to taking out the plane, I it was an eye opener. But Jeez. but the but with that said, though we picked we picked the guy up and uh, he he had lived in, lived in America for twenty years, didn't speak a lick of English. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and uh, he still, still only spoke Russian, and uh, nah. uh, we ended up flying, flying him back to uh, back to Kodiak, and he had hypothermia. Spent a couple of days in the hospital, but after that, all was good. Wow, man! Yeah, I'd forgotten all about that. It was a lot of good times. <laughs> you know, Alaska is. Uh, I, I was blessed to be stationed there, and with the the shop I had up there as my mentors, I. I can't say enough good things about everybody that was there and, you know, but it, you're talking about like the halibut opener that was not there during my time. They had that, that quota, but yeah. what we did have while I was there was the King crab season and the, I believe the snow crab season off the top of my head. Right. Right. Or the blue, maybe blue crab, whatever the other crab season is. No, it was, it was snow crab. So, okay. So, and you would have, Basically, both those were a two-week period, and it did not matter what the weather forecast was. The whole, like, uh, or, or the like, the upper half of the Bering Sea could be all frozen in. Nope. Here's your dates. Go. And you would, I mean, I remember big waves. Big, yeah, yeah. You know, people, fact, people, I got I got lowered down into one. I'll tell you this one story. And side note: it's, it's not about me, but I'm telling you what it is. Story. Tell me. So I want to hear it. We get it wasn't even a rescue. It wasn't anything. But so uh, uh, the beacon gets popped off the boat, like the the four hundred one beacon. Boo, boo, boo. Right. Yeah. So Wait, Coast Guard call. Hold on. Hold on. How'd that go? Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that good? Good second time around. That was good. I like it. <laughs> so the beacon drops in the water off this boat. Well, they're like, hey, Coast Guard, we just dropped this in the water. Eric fell off the boat. It's going off. We're going to continue fishing because we're in this window. And we're like, yeah, roger that. No problem. So we go out. And this is just so happened my duty day. The waves are, it's a 30 foot wave. This is the biggest wave I've ever been. They're like, hey, Quinny, you want to go get that beacon? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> they lower me down. I get in the water. I'm like, these are big freaking waves right here. <laughs> Next thing I know, I got Ray Stabinski and he was my flight back. Uh, I, I grab, I grab the, uh, the beacon and I'm holding on and he's like pointing in front of me as I get off, like, I get picked up out of the water on the backside of the wave. Here comes that next wave. Boom. I'm like, oh, oh, that's what that Man. feels like. <laughs> and you couldn't have any better than Ray Stabinski. Ray's oh, as good awesome as guy. Straight up awesome. But yeah, you uh, couldn't so. get any better than him. Nope. So, but anyways, it's, so that, it, like, not even a life save. Just I got the DMB. I got the, I got the marker. <laughs> hey, that's all that matters. We, uh, oh. You know, it, Alaska is a crazy place and it, everything's extreme. You know, there's a lot of people who who uh, meet their maker in Alaska. Um, yeah. We have a lot, a lot of big cases up there, but it doesn't matter if it's the weather or just the working environment. Everything's the extreme in Alaska. When people, co people complain about the price of king crab, I'll tell you, I will never, ever pay, co um, complain about the price of king crab because... If people saw what those guys really go through yeah. to catch king crab, yeah. holy cow. Like the deadliest catch, you get that. to see a get a glimpse of what they're dealing with, but you don't 
like the perspective is not quite there because you can't relate to anything like that. Like that's not normal living. You you don't have an appreciation for how cold you truly are, how wet you are, you know, how moody you are. You haven't slept in days. I mean, it's a tough, tough environment and people don't realize how, how dangerous it really is, honestly. And I will never, I will never complain about the price of King Crown. (laughs) Still expensive. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, hey, it's not ex- it's not expensive if your name's Jason Quinn and you're making all kinds of money. Oh, really? good lord, please. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> oh, it's funny, man, dude. I, I appreciate these stories, man. This is this has been good stuff. Um, what? So I know you're doing stuff with drones and stuff now, which is pretty cool, and. And the other thing I'm, I'm going to ask you before, like we kind of wrap up, is, you know, what do you have any recommendations? Do you, you know, anything that you would pass on to the younger generation of guys that are, or even guys that are out there now that are still doing it? You know, yeah, you a load of experience. So, so, so what I'm doing now is, uh, you know, after I retired, um, I went to work for Boeing, and uh, um, they have a program uh, where they're putting unmanned aviation. Um, vehicles or UAS um, out on board um, ships. It's called Scan Eagle. And, um, you know, it's a program that's been going for quite some time. They did a lot of, the way the company came to be was they came, they came up with this idea as a science project to collect weather data for NOAA about the time that Desert Storm was kicking off. And they ultimately ended up flying for the Marine Corps. And after they flew for the Marine Corps in Desert Storm, um, it, it just really took off. And then they recruited me to come to the company right after I retired from the Coast Guard. And I came on board and looked at it and like, yeah, it seemed like a pretty good fit. And then after I really got my feet wet, I was like, and I saw all the great things that they were doing with the U.S. Navy, um, most notably. Um, so right when I came on board, the first project I worked on was uh, Captain Phillips. Um, so if you've ever seen the movie Captain Phillips. Yeah. Um, who was captured by the Somali pirates. Yeah. So we actually had a Scan Eagle team that was on board the USS Bainbridge and my guys actually found Captain Phillips. So to make a long story short, they had commandeered the, uh, the ship and then Captain Phillips and the Somalis got into the rescue boat. They took off and they just motored away. Well, they found the ship, but nobody could find the, uh, the rescue boat that the Somalis were trying to get away in with Captain Phillips. And then my guys with Scan Eagle actually found, found the, uh, um, the rescue boat and Captain Phillips, and then the USS Bainbridge captured them and uh, killed all the pirates, saved Captain Phillips, and the rest is history. But my guys with Scan Eagle actually found um, Captain Phillips. Um, and but when I came on board and I saw this great work, I was like, why the heck aren't we doing this? And we being the Coast Guard. Yeah. And so I started pushing that rock uphill. It took a few years, and we were actually able to. Um, finally get scan eagle out on board the national security cutters on on board the cutter stratton and um and then from there it grew to we're on board all national security cutters now and it's the largest uas program in the world and um and i'm pretty proud of the, all the good work that we've done with the coast guard now doing this and it's it's primarily drug interdiction is the major mission although we do hit all 11 statutory missions of the coast guard um, in some form or another. We're also doing work in uh, the Indo-Pacific on board um, national security cutters now. But the big thing is over the, just just in the past two years, as we were talking before we came on air, is um, just in the past two years, we've captured with Scan Eagle on board national security cutters over $6 billion worth of cocaine wholesale. Jeez, and, oh man, good for you guys. So, yeah, and so... Um, what that really means, though, is uh, that's wholesale. By the time it hits street value, it goes up, any, depending on where it's uh, distributed at, anywhere between 3 and 7x. So, I mean, you're talking about some serious change here. You're almost yeah. in, the, in the Jason Quinn money range now. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, which is zero, by the way. I just throw <laughs> that out there. I mean. <laughs> nah, so it's done, it's done a lot of really, really good things. And... Um, um, you know, I, I've, it's helped me 
you know, work with the Coast Guard, you know, stay in touch with the, my Coast Guard family. It's funny because I'm at headquarters now all the time, which I, I avoided headquarters my entire Coast Guard career. And so I don't know how I'm end up there. I'm at headquarters all the time now. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, and it's also afforded me the opportunity to, you know, make new friends. Like the guy I was talking about, Dan Broadhurst, who uh, was in the 65 in front of me. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, he and I became close friends over the program. Uh, working with scan eagle and um yeah it just, it, it's just it's crazy i go to all the parties that the headquarters now i i got i got the commandant's personal number if you can believe that and, right uh, hey, so hey, you, hey how want, you doing huh <laughs> if, we, if we want to get liquored up and we can drunk dial and we can actually do that although i would not advise it yeah um, i I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna tap out of that one I'm just yeah gonna... that's a, probably a good move um <laughs> But no, it's uh, it's really, it's been great to stay involved with the Coast Guard, work very closely, and, and still support the men and women of the Coast Guard so they can do a better job. And, you know, the Scan Eagle mission that I'm most proud of, it has nothing to do with the drugs. It, it really has to do with um, a, a 65 case. So we had a case where Scan Eagle found, found a boat, uh, a drug boat, in the middle of the night. This is down off South America. They're still trying to run away from the... Uh, um, from the boat and so scan eagle finds them ascends to a safe altitude and just surveils them the entire time the 65 moves in and 65 is uh, it's like two or three o'clock in the morning and they're 30 miles from the ship and they get ready to um, pull the trigger and shoot the engines out of the boat and they're they're at 100 feet and the pilot goes vertigo and they go into a nosedive from 100 feet oh my gosh Exactly. And they recovered just before they hit the water. And the beauty of this is the drug boat got away. But the beauty of this is, is that the helicopter was able to um, recover just before they impacted the water. Well, let's just say for the sake of argument, they did impact the water. You know, this would have been the ship would have been like, hey, we haven't heard from the helicopter yet. All right. 15 more minutes. We still haven't heard from them. Let's head over that way. Yeah. With Scan Eagle there, they were able to see everything play out real time. They knew exactly what was going on. They saw the helicopter was in trouble. They were able to repair the flight deck. They were able to do everything because they could watch it real time because Scan Eagle was there, you know, giving them surveillance. Oh, and, that's awesome. And so the part that makes me most proud of this is, let's just say, for instance, they did hit the water. We would have been able to protect our air crew and do the best job we could to save the air crew is quickly it, quicker than we would have been able to do without scan eagle yeah and so adding that level of safety um has been tremendous not to mention i, I was talking to you earlier about a case we did up in the bering sea where i woke up in the morning and uh turn on the news and there's scan eagle footage of a swimmer being lowered down to down to a processor in the bering sea yeah and so i was pretty, pretty proud to see that but the part i didn't tell you was before the helicopter, they got it. So it was a medevac off the ship. Scan Eagle was already on patrol. Scan Eagle flies for 12, 12 hours plus. And so once it's in the air, it's just flying and patrolling. But when this case came in for the medevac, they diverted Scan Eagle over to the, uh, uh, over to the processor. So before the beauty of this was before the helicopter crew even left the ship, they were actually able to see the ship, see what the on-scene weather was like, see where where everything was on this ship so they could determine where they want to hoist to, what they want to do, how they want to do the rescue. So they're mentally better prepared as they walk out there to do the rescue. Man, and so, that's great. And so having that situational awareness and be able to see this real time is a huge asset and a big, um, you know, a big win because you, you know what it's like every time you fly out there, it, you never know what you're walking into as right. much as you try to you try to talk to them and they're talking to you things aren't always quite as they were they were you know as they were stated yeah and so having this situational awareness of being able to see real time it lets them better prepare and be able to go in and prosecute the rescue um much better with a much greater mindset on how to get business done right and so that that's been a great great thing and and I'm really proud of all the hard work in the program that we've put together and all the good things that are happening. And, uh, you know, the commandant, um, actually the past three commandants have made, you know, absolutely huge statements. I've gotten to be good friends with all three of them. And, you know, they've given huge public accolades, um, which has been, you know, pretty, uh, pretty nice to hear. 
and yeah. see some of the things that uh, that they're doing and form those relationships. But um, yeah, in December, I actually left Boeing and um, took a new position with a new company called Cellgrown. I'm a vice president there now. And Congratulations. Building, thank you. And we're building unmanned surface via vessels. So um, we're actually going out and surveilling. We're doing everything from um, mapping the ocean floor to um, using sensors that are on the vessels to uh, um, conduct maritime domain awareness or drug interdiction wow. with the vessels. So we're doing everything from atmospheric and oceanic work to um, to drug interdiction type stuff. So it's uh, Good it's for one more you. tool. Yeah, one more tool that we you know working to get it for the. You know, we've already done some Coast Guard work, looking to do some more as well as do some work in Southcom and, um, and Paycom. And uh, yeah, it should be some good stuff coming down the road. So it's just uh, just added another tool to the toolbox for the boys on the front line. Dude. But I'm not going to lie to you. I'd rather be on the front line than I would be, be back at home. <laughs> Man, I, I still like being on the front line. I told you, I mean, last night I was out doing a medevac and you know, Dude, I'm so, I, I, I cannot begin to tell you how envious I am. <laughs> and, and you know what? It was, it, it was easy. It was a landing. Just pick the patient up, you know, roll in, bring him to the, to the hospital. Uh, but it's, it's still one of those things, you know, like that, that phone call comes in, the alarm goes off. You're like, oh, oh, yeah, I got to go to work. <laughs> Man, I love that. That, yeah. that is, those are the best days in the world. I'm envious yeah. that you're still doing it. So. Yeah. Hats One of my favorite things board. is is taking off. I still love that even now. I've been I've been doing. I mean, twenty years I've been flying, and and even last night, like I go to take off, you know, helicopter gives you that little five foot, you know, hover, and then boom, they just pull power, roll that yeah. nose over, and I'm like, yes, I love it. That that is good stuff. Yeah, without a doubt. Anyway. Yeah, you were asking about advice and, you know, I didn't know what to say when you just brought that up, that question up. Um, um, but there's a couple of things. The first thing I'll say is that um, a few years ago, I ran into Bobby Watson on a plane and we just happened to be sitting across from each other on a commercial flight. And Bob Watson. Bob Watson, Bob ladies Watson. and gentlemen, is, oh, gosh, I, there's nothing more. I, You know what? Bob Watson. Bob Amazing. Watson is one of the most solid swimmers you will ever meet in your lifetime. True Greatest statement. guy in the world um, from top to bottom. Great yep. family. He's just a great, he is a great American. Um, but Bob had told me something that I had completely forgot about. And so he was an MK. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a, a machinery technician. He works on, works on engines yeah. in the Coast Guard. And before he applied to become a rescue swimmer. And when I was in Houston, and I remember him coming to the shop, he came to the shop, him and another guy came to the shop and like, hey, I wanna be a rescue swimmer. What should I do? What can you tell me? Give me some advice. And um, I don't remember saying this, Bob brought this up to me and said it was some of the best advice he's ever received. Um, I, don't, I don't remember saying it. I remember Bob coming to the shop, but I don't remember saying this, but I'm sure I'm in it in a pretty smart ass way. But he's like, what can I do? And I said, don't quit. That is great advice. Don't quit. And that is it. Don't quit. I mean, no matter how bad it gets. And, and I, I say that now for the guys that are coming in and, um, you know, the guys that are deployed out there, no matter how bad things get, don't quit. Um, but I think, it, I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's straight to the point. But I honestly think, you know, I've given this a lot of thought and Admiral Courier and I have talked about this extensively. Um, I think one of the things that we do not do well in the Coast Guard, and I didn't realize this until being out of the Coast Guard and um, looking back on not only my career, but all of our careers. And what we don't do is we don't do a good job of mentoring our people. Um, you know, now that I'm out in the professional industry now, you know, people have executive coaches, you know, you can hire somebody to coach you. Yeah. You can latch on to a mentor. Um, but honestly, we need to do a better job of mentoring our people and our people need to do a better job of asking for help. I can tell you that I don't care if it's taking the service wide or just day-to-day -day struggles, whether it be financial or whatever it may be at work. We as a whole swimmers don't ask for help typically. Nope. Um, 
and uh, and honestly, we don't know how to ask for help or or who to ask for help. And you know, if you're talking about your shop chief, your shop chief is only a year or two older than you and doesn't have much more experience than you. You really need to find some mentors and some people um, that can really help you along. And whether it be inside the Coast Guard, outside the Coast Guard, finding people who help mentor you in your life and help you make great decisions. And I was extremely fortunate post Coast Guard. I wish I had him around more in my life during the Coast Guard, but Admiral Courier was an absolutely, he passed away last year. And um, it was a huge, huge personal loss for me because he is by far one of the best mentors I've ever had. And there are just so many life skills that you can learn from somebody who's got the experience, yeah. whether it be, whether it be um, career advice or financial advice or relationship advice. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Go out and get some help. Find out, you know, find the right people. Don't ask just anybody. Find somebody who's doing it right, whatever it is or whatever you're dealing with and ask for help, get help from people and solicit their advice, learn from them. Yeah. Be, and it doesn't mean you don't even have to be in a situation where things aren't going well. You just need more advice. We can all learn. So don't be afraid to solicit people's um, advice so you can learn from them. You know, I watched so many, I watched so many of the current admirals on the Coast Guard who would call Admiral Courier and say, hey, what do I do? How do I handle this? And I will tell you, you know, one of the things that I've learned is even at the com vice commandant and commandant level, they will call people who were previous commandants or vice commandants, both in the Coast Guard or other services and solicit their advice. We're all, you know, none of us know it all, right. nobody. And we all need more advice and more help. And they, you know, even at the, even at the highest levels, they're looking for mentorship and, and help too. And I will tell you that I think that's part of the reason they excel to the highest levels is because they do solicit other people's advice and look for, um, you know, words of wisdom, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it, we need to do more of that. And I think that, and that that's the biggest piece of advice I can give is, you know, solicit people's advice, look for help, even if you don't need help, you know, look, look at it as a learning experience and, and try to gain all you can from other people. So you can, you can do it, whatever it is the right way. Yeah. Ah, great advice. That's all I got. Ron Tremaine, ladies and gentlemen, right there, buddy. Thank you for coming on. I, I Winnie, can't, it's been a it pleasure. Has been such a good time seeing you and spend some time with you. Thank you so much for asking me to come. Um, it's been a great experience and I'm really glad to see you and your family are doing incredible things. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I am so envious and I might hate you just a little bit because you're <laughs> able to you still have the opportunity to get back in the plane every day. Oh, whatever. I love <laughs> you too, man. <laughs> I love you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and like my daughters like to tell me, like and subscribe. Oh yeah. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story that they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest. Or if you have any questions about any of the rescues or anything else that we talk about here on this podcast, send me an email therealrescue at gmail.com that's t-h-e-r-e-a-l-r-e-s-q at gmail.com you can also check us out on our facebook and instagram page at the real rescue that's at t-h-e-r-e-a-l-r-e-s-q i also want to give a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today always remember that when that sar alarm goes off those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>